Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, update webinar with Monero Alamos. Uh, my name is Jarrett McPherson. I'm the Vice President of Research here at Red Cloud, and with me, uh, with me today is uh, Doug Ramshaw, who's the President and Director of Monero Alamos. Um, format of the webinar for today, we're gonna, I'll provide a brief uh, update on the gold market and why we think we're in a new bull market. Uh, Doug's going to provide a, an overview on Monero Alamos and sort of what we expect next from them, and then we'll open the, uh, open the call to live questions. Um, to, just to start, I need to, to get through some uh, disclosures. Uh, for Monero Alamos, there will be some forward-looking statements made on this call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of the Monero Alamos corporate presentation located in the investor section of the company's corporate website. For Red Cloud, there will be some, uh, for Red Cloud, uh, Klondike Strike Inc., please see the full disclaimer and disclosures on our most recent Monero Alamos note on our website. And I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Prespit should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Specific to Red Cloud as related to Monero Alamos, in the last 12 months, Red Cloud has been retained under a service or advisory agreement by Monero Alamos. And Red Cloud, uh, Red Cloud, remember the Red Cloud team has a long position in uh, Monero Alamos shares. So now that that's out of the way, um, we'll uh, talk a little about well, why we think we're in a new bull market uh, for gold. So uh, obviously, uh, the reason the, the 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 those of you that are on the call here today or on the webinar today, obviously you you believe something you believe in the gold market somewhat as uh, as you're here to listen to to, to Doug talk about Monero Alamos, and, and so I, I'm going to assume that you're bullish on the space, but I'm going to tell you there's a couple of reasons why why we're really bullish on the space right now. Um, first, the uh, on the slide, looking at over to slide three. Um, I think the key thing here is that we have a situation where we have an exceptional amount of negative, uh, negative real and nominal rates. There's almost $15 trillion of government, government debt that has a negative nominal rate. And then on top of that, uh, we have uh, negative real rates with respect uh, when you adjust those for inflation. And you know, as you can see from this chart, when in those periods of negative, uh, negative real rates, gold, uh, gold historically outperforms. And so we're, ex we're expecting we're entering something like that. The second, uh, the second, uh, the second reason that we think we're in a new bull market is, is probably a rather intuitive one. Um, people are buying gold. Um, and so here is the, the fund flows for the uh, gold back ETFs uh, have been significant and to the point where we're back to sort of March 2013 levels uh, when the last bull market was sort of ending. So a significant amount of, uh, of pure investor interest. And, and, and our, our view on a, on a bull market is, is that those gold-backed ETFs are usually the first ones to see fund flows, and then it works its way to uh, equity derivative ETFs, and then uh, and then down to, to junior miners. And actually, if you you know talk about what a bull market uh, what a bull market looks like, we go to you know on uh, on slide six, you'll see this is, a, this is the uh, 2001, December 2001 to December 2004 is one of the, lot, the more recent bull markets in gold. And, and you can see that these, these smaller market cap companies, the, this, the silver and the, and the uh, blue lines uh, materially outperform their larger peers, uh, particularly as the, as the market moves on. And then if you go to the, the more, recent, more recently uh, on, on the next slide, is January 2009 to January 2011 bull market, and you can see in this case the, the small cap, uh, smaller cap companies really outperformed. And so this is, you know, this is where you want to be as this bull market, uh, as a bull market starts to uh, uh, starts to develop. So, you know, and then why and why is smaller and better? Why is smaller better? Why do we see this trend? Well, the, the, the trend is, is very simple. The lack of exploration spending that happens in a bear market leads to a lack of discoveries, which means there's fewer new mines for the larger companies to buy, and then you have declining reserves. And it res the end result is the cycle advances and these larger companies are looking for growth. The M&A, uh, um, we get an M&A cycle that occurs and then these smaller companies get uh, get taken out. So, you know, if we if you're in a bull market, uh, you know what to buy. I mean, just because the just because the gold price is going up doesn't mean that the rising tide floats all boats. But there's a few things to be to be to. There's three things that we focus on that to. Uh, um, sorry, there's three things that we focus on when looking at junior mining stocks. Uh, I think, firstly, uh, before we get to those three things, which is really five, 
Uh, the first two things are, don't forget about the fundamentals. Management matters. Good management can deliver, can deliver on, on, on lower quality projects and bad, and bad management can destroy good ones. And the second is a uh, balance sheet. Uh, always have, have a look at each company's balance sheet. Can they, do they have the capital structure to deliver what they say they're going to do? Uh, and I think those are always, always two key, key things and they're not, certainly not exclusive to, uh, to mining. Then, you know, on to the three things when you look at it, specifically at junior mining stocks. One, uh, first is scarcity. Economic projects in good jurisdictions are very rare uh, and large projects are very rare as well. And so those are, you know, that's the first thing that we look for. Is this, is this something that's scarce? Is it something that someone else want? Two, it, it is news flow. Good news is good for stocks in the bull market. So is the company going to deliver good news? It, do they have the ability to do it? Do they have the, the cash, the, uh, the, the capital to do it or the ability to, to move things ahead? And three, is the potential, is it big enough to matter? And the, and the, and the simple test for us is always, is this in something like this in, in production in the world somewhere else? Um, it's a really simple way to look at it and say, okay, the, this project looks interesting, but does it, is there something like this out there uh, that looks good? So that, those are our, uh, our, 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 our keys on uh, picking junior mining stocks. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the, one of our one of the names that we like, and uh, obviously why we're hosting this webinar with uh, with Doug is uh, is Monero Alamo. So I'm going to uh, turn it uh, over to Doug, and so he can uh, tell us about Monero Alamo and why it fits. Why I think it fits those those three criteria, and why we uh, why we like the stock. Uh, thanks, Derek. Uh, let me just get this presentation up and running. And turn myself off there. Um, yeah, I appreciate the introduction, and certainly I think we all appreciate the gold market we're in uh, seemingly right now. Um, uh, Monero is a Mexican focused gold mine developer, um, and we're going to approach our uh, production path as a multi asset development approach. And we think that that provides some um, uh, organic production growth that is largely lost amongst the big. Mining companies they've got so large that uh, you don't see the the uh, the early production growth profile that they had 10, 20 years ago. Um, so you know even in a flat gold market that organic production growth uh, can can improve. And not a couple of months ago uh, I was giving this presentation in thirteen hundred dollar gold saying we don't need higher gold prices. We'll take that as gravy. And it looks like we're in the gravy zone right now. But uh, our team, and to speak to Derek's point on management, um, you know, we build mines not because there's no other option for our assets. We build mines because that's what our skill set is. Uh, we like doing it. Uh, the team that uh, our CEO Darren uh, Cunningham has put together has had uh, three successful mine builds over the last 12 years, and our focus is is largely in Mexico, where our team has uh, ably uh, proven itself. Um, and we have strong operational expertise in heat bleach mining. Um, so it might not be the highest grade in the world, but uh, really it, it shouldn't be about high grade versus low grade. It should all be about margin. And, uh, you know, so we're looking at assets that can work at 1250 gold, that can stress test at a thousand and can give our shareholders uh, full leverage to, uh, to higher prices. Uh, the other core competency of our group um, is, is we really do focus on uh, low capital intensity projects, and uh, I, I will go into that in a little bit more detail shortly, but uh, we do not have the major capital requirements, which can be an impediment to uh, a, a company of our size to actually get up and running. Uh, so, so right now we have a 200% owned uh, open pit development stage assets, uh, both basically permitted um, and so this year was a big transitional year as we move from developer to uh, a builder of mines. And next year, uh, we'll see the first gold production. Uh, we're backed by a Cisco Gold Royalties. We're, uh, they're our largest shareholder. They own just around 13%. And not only do they provide uh, access to us for um, capital uh, that we may need, uh, they they complement a, a very strong technical team that we have, um, and and we couldn't be happier to have them as a partner. Um, you know, we are very comfortable operating in Mexico. We've operated there for 12 years. So despite some of the um, headlines that the new government uh, have created in in our press from time to time, 
some of our recent news uh, in, in regards to permitting, I think, shows that Mexico is a mining country. Uh, you know, uh, efforts in any country in the world should be a collaboration, both at community level and at government level for everyone's mutual benefit. And, and we're certainly seeing uh, limited change in, in our operational um, uh, set up down in Mexico uh, with the new government uh, that most most ably shown by the uh, the permit news uh, we had just a week ago. Uh, we trade on the venture, uh, you know, roughly 15, 16 cents. Uh, so, uh, you know, a 60 million market cap as it stands right now. Uh, we have uh, 376 million shares out, uh, virtually no warrant overhang. We had a warrant overhang on the stock for uh, best part of the first six months of this year, and they've all either been exercised or expired. So we're very happy that there's no artificial ceiling on the stock moving forward. Um, and I'm, I'm less concerned about our shares outstanding, which are providing a very nice liquid stock right now. I would be if I was exploring moose pasture in Manitoba. Um, and I'm not sure why I always pick on Manitoba, but there it is. Uh, for us as a uh, eminent producer, we, we like to think we're a market cap story. And uh, certainly that has not been lost on um, both analysts at Hayward and Cormark Securities this year who initiated coverage uh, on the on the stock. Roughly 50% of our shareholders are a Cisco, um, other institutions, management, and uh, a couple of generalists, Donald Smith Value Fund and the Aegis Value Fund. And I think one of the reasons we've attracted generalist investors is um, we're speaking their metrics. We're focusing on growing this uh, slowly, steadily, focusing on the bottom line, and it, that's music to the ears of our general uh, backers. Uh, the team, uh, led by Darren Kernigan uh, and a number of members on this slide, are, are uh, people that Darren has worked with at those three mine builds over the last 12 years in Mexico. Uh, we have a strong uh, technical team. Um, and as I said, ably supported by uh, a Cisco. And, you know, in the interest of pushing forward to the Q&A, uh, you know, there's there's a few of these slides that maybe I won't linger on too much because I know time is is a precious commodity for, for everyone that has taken the trouble to call in today. I'm, I'm all about talking about the present and the future. Um, and in some, in some regards, I hope that this slide will be defunct when we get our next mine up and running because we don't need to talk about the past. But I think it is important um, to just explain the success that we've had in terms of building out a mine and how we do it and why we do it for such low capex. So Darren and a number of members of the team had a company called Castle Gold. It built a mine in 2008, El Castillo in Mexico, uh, and they built a 25,000 ounce a year operation for just seven, a fraction under seven million US capex. It had a starting resource of 300,000 ounces, but a tremendous amount of expiration upside. And so rather than diluting shareholders to death, um, and doing the constant dance with the equity markets, it was build the mine, get it up and running, and then out of cash flow, expand the resource base. And as you expand the resource base, as they did to 50,000 ounces a year, and we're heading to 75,000 ounces a year, um, when Argonaut bought them for $130 million, uh, to just two years later, that resource had quadrupled in size. Um, and, and we feel that's a far better approach, this bootstrapping approach to building, uh, an operation whilst taking into account our shareholders. Um, and so, you know, this will be the, the same approach we take, uh, with regard to Santana, um, which we'll be speaking to at length today. Uh, El Castillo still remains to this day a foundational uh, production asset for, for Argonaut Gold who bought them. And, and that's a chart from Cormark Securities that just shows, uh, you know, what an outlier we are in terms of capital intensity. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got, we actually have three assets, two are hundred percent owned, Santana and Fortuna. Uh, the third, because we wanted to show focus on, um, the hundred percent owned Guadalupe de los Reyes was a, uh, earn in, uh, deal with Vista Gold. 
uh, it still had some um, uh, option payments due this year where we wanted to deploy capital to more advanced projects. And really for a company of our size, these, these initial two were more than enough to get going. So we're, we're retaining a almost 20% equity ownership in the company we assigned the Guadalupe asset to. We like that asset. Um, it's just uh, it with the focus on Santana and Fortuna, we weren't doing it justice. So our shareholders will have ample uh, equity exposure to the new company that will be advancing that. So today, um, uh, I'll be focusing basically on Santana and Fortuna. We focus on northern Mexico. Um, you know, the, I take my hat off to the companies operating in southern Mexico and some extremely well down there. It's a tougher part of the country. We're, we're very comfortable in Sonora and in Durango. Um, the state of Sonora is very pro-mining. Uh, it wasn't just us who received uh, environmental uh, approvals recently. Silvercrest in Sonora also did. Um, you know, and this is coming out of a period of transitional government uh, bureaucracy uh, post the election where, you know, things slowed for a while. Things are getting going again. And, and certainly uh, in Sonora, we're, we're, we're delighted to, to collaborate with our communities and, and the state government there. And, and now the federal support for our project that we received uh, just the other week. So Santana. Um, it's it's an interesting project, and I think I'll, I'll get into this in a little bit more detail because I think there will be some obvious questions uh, with Derek on this. It's a modest project. I I would uh, say it's it's somewhat analogous in size to the El Castillo project that that Castle Gold was built off and and around. It's there's a three to three hundred and fifty thousand ounce resource, and our goal here is to put it into production in very similar fashion to what we did at El Castillo. Uh, the build is is roughly 10 million capex Canadian. Um, and now with the permits in hand, uh, we're really just waiting out the rainy season um, to, to aim for construction starting uh, uh, towards the end of this year. It's a six month build. It's a heap leach operation um, where our, our initial production is going to be focused on two open pits but uh, there's tremendous exploration upside on this property and, and we've already identified new discoveries last year that we've, we're following up with an announcement we made today. Um, Santana is uh, a 0.8 of a gram um, hydrothermal breccia uh, that is very amenable to heat bleach. Uh, we've, there was over 30,000 meters of drilling done on the project, about 20,000 of which was in the core areas that we've defined our starting pits. Um, and not only have we, we've got a real handle on the resource there, uh, we, we did extensive bulk mining uh, test work, uh, almost 50,000 ton uh, bulk uh, heap leach, uh, a different, uh, both on uh, coarse and fine crushed uh, material and run of mine. And, uh, you know, we're looking at recovered gold values of approaching 0.7 of a gram per ton there, which is almost twice the head grade of uh, a typical project in the Great Basin. And, uh, and that allows us to build these things out in a very modular manner. Um, so, so we're excited to, to get this one up and running um, and to join the ranks of gold producers uh, at a time where the gold market is, is getting exciting. So, you know, I've always said the best way to play the gold market is, market is to be producing it. And, and that is our intention. And the goal will be for this. It's a roughly six, seven month build. Uh, we would we would hope to have production up and running uh, towards the end of Q2 of next year. Uh, all these commercial production designs were submitted as part of our permitting process. Um, the next step for this project will be um, a modest amount of exploration. We announced a 10,000 meter program at the beginning of the year. We, we held off actually starting this. We own our own rig. We held off starting in this until we got the permits in place. Uh, we will be able to drill during the rainy season. Um, that drilling probably around uh, the extensions of the known pits uh, because our drilling last year um, where we were drilling uh, step outs from the the existing pits that we defined was hitting um, you know ore grade uh, heat bleachable material so uh, we we want to just get a real handle on that um, before uh, before breaking ground on the, on the pits 
there were also some very interesting uh, new discoveries we made last year, similar pipes like the Zada pipe in the southeast, other targets around, and a new, more porphyritic looking uh, discovery that we just tagged with one hole just on the edge of it last year, returned 95 meters of 0.85 gold, a uh, third of a percent copper and a third of an ounce silver. Um, and uh, and that just tagged the edge of it. And all this is is pretty much comes to surface. So so we're excited about what that could you know, could mean to the district as a whole. Uh, we got a large pro property package and, and lots of upside uh, to building off the, the starter resource at Nietzsche. Um, the big question, and, and I, it's a lengthy conversation probably for a Q&A. So, you know, that, that 9, 10 million in Canadian, I, mean, I will go back a couple of slides if you don't mind. So the, the build for this um, is 9 or 10 million Canadian. Um, and I've, I've gone on record and we'll stick to what I've said on record that we will, uh, we will not be funding that with equity. Um, we did an equity raise at the beginning of the year. I wasn't happy uh, raising at 10 cents uh, in March, but we did it with existing uh, funds and there was no warrant attached to it. Um, we, we have a roughly 4 million in cash right now. Um, the goal will be to work with our, um, our shareholder, a royalty company to, for some form of uh, royalty arrangement to fund the, the capex that will build this project. Uh, I very much hope that that uh, can be announced to the market sooner rather than later. Um, and uh, yeah, I can certainly talk uh, more to that in the Q&A section. Our second uh, project, this was an, actually a, an asset that Darren owned in Castle Gold. When Argonaut bought Castle Gold, they went and proceeded to buy uh, Pediment Gold in Sonora. Um, and Fortuna kind of sat on the sidelines within uh, Argonaut. So Darren bought it back for just a couple of million bucks a few years back and a capped royalty on it. Uh, so we've been developing that project. We know it intimately. In fact, the last real work that was done on it was done when Darren and his team had it. And uh, we came out with a PEA on this project in August of last year. Um, and that was purely based around a high grade starter pit. Uh, again, just like Santana, we have large property packages that surround our core deposits, and there's plenty of upside to build out um, uh, significantly more resources. But we modeled a, a PEA just on a five-year uh, starter pit that's going to be three and a half to four gram uh, per ton gold, roughly six to one strip ratio. Unlike Santana, this is not a, a heap leach. Um, but we own a 2,000 ton a day mill that's been acquired. It's ready to ship down to, to Mexico. Um, and given that the PEA uh, suggested 1,100 ton a day operation, again, it allows us to see that within each of our projects, we have organic uh, expansion potential um, to raise our production profile uh, that much more significantly uh, over time. Uh, the details of the PEA, uh, you know, spoke for themselves when we came out with it. Uh, uh, we model everything at 1250 gold. I'm not sure if that will change in this environment. We want uh, a business that can work in the best of times and uh, the worst of times. Uh, just like uh, Santana, we have very low capex for a 50,000 ounce a year operation. The capex in the PEA came in at around 27 million US. Um, and the reason we're going to build these out in a modular manner um, is we don't mind taking some debt on to build this if we're cash flowing at the first operation. So the goal is to bring Santana on in 2020. Uh, there's about a 12 month construction timeline for Fortuna. Um, we're working with some debt groups right now. Uh, we, we certainly as a, uh, a dual asset, uh, company. Um, with cash flow off of first operations and don't mind taking debt on for the second. And so it, it does allow us to kind of look at a production profile in the 80 to 100,000 ounce a year uh, range from these first two operations, just at their initial production rates um, and see very limited need to raise additional equity to get these two into production. Um, and again, we, we just view that as obviously uh, very shareholder friendly. 
um, the expiration potential. This was not has not been drilled, and really no systematic expiration since two thousand eight nine. Where, as I said, incidentally, that was when our team was working this project. So it's kind of sat there dormant, uh, but no team knows this project better uh, than us. And there are extensions to the known, the, the, the main deposit we're talking about in that PEA is that star in the middle of the map there. There are extensions to that that weren't included in the PEA. Uh, there is potential throughout the property. Um, and whether that this drilling uh, forms part of a, our exploration programs this year or, or more likely next year, we, we really don't want to do any exploration that isn't funded from cash flow. There was a need to do some this year, a modest amount. But I, I expect uh, as we move forward that uh, our exploration um, is going to become quite extensive. And we, we like the fact that it gives our shareholders a full gamut of of, of both production and development and expiration news. Um, so as we come out of this bottom of the Lasson curve, where news flow tends to be uh, very important, but probably pretty boring in comparison to some companies, permitting construction kind of news, uh, I, I look forward to augmenting that with a lot of expiration news uh, uh, moving forward. Um, we will own uh, almost 20% of a company, Power Metals, that is about to be renamed, uh, uh, that will take on the Guadalupe asset. And we, we really like this asset, but we think our shareholders will have a lot of exposure to it through our 20% shareholding in uh, prime mining. So what does this all mean? Because I know, you know, at some point, uh, a business plan has to make sense for why you want to uh, uh, invest in it. So... You know, we, we're looking at an aggressive growth profile over the next three years that will take us to a 150,000 ounce a year, uh, producer. Uh, we think we can do that in a, uh, very slow, steady, uh, build out of Santana followed by Fortuna. Um, uh, Santana is already demonstrating to us expansion potential. And once we've started moving Santana forward, I think we will be looking to rejuvenate the, project pipeline with uh, additional assets that don't necessarily have to be large to start with, so long as they lend themselves to uh, brownfields exploration upside. Uh, we, we've shown uh, uh, a disposition to a positive disposition to, to actually going after assets which kind of lie stagnating because they don't have the scale for a lot of people. But if you have the right operating team, you can turn those into um, uh, real operations with real growth potential. And uh, we did it at Castle Gold. And next year, we'll do it at Santana. And it will be nice to start talking about the present and the future a little bit more um, than, than the past. But uh, the past, I think, really does demonstrate the core competency of the group in actually building things successfully. Um, what does this all mean? These are some charts we borrowed from uh, Cormark Securities uh, when they initiated coverage um, in terms of uh, the production profile. Uh, they see they see us growing, uh, you know, in in largely to where where we are. They haven't modeled any real upside in the expiration at these projects or a, a third asset come in. So, you know, they're perhaps a little modest in terms of some of their uh, their projections, but they're, they're, they're doing that with what they, the information they have on it, on in hand. Um, you know, we, we feel like we have a, a projected all in sustaining costs that will be um, supportable uh, e even at some of the lowest gold prices we saw in this last cycle and obviously one that can capitalize greatly moving forward if we, we truly are in a new uh, gold market that, uh, that has some years ahead of it. Um, more, most importantly, we're, we're less than a year away from being able to join the, the ranks of gold producers to fully take advantage of this moving gold prices. Um, uh, and this just gives you a sense of the, ca the cash flows uh, that we're expecting from this project. And we do all this at 1250 gold because to be perfectly frank, if we use higher gold prices, um, you know, the numbers get quite cartoonish. So uh, we think we have a unique approach to building out these mines, one that will really resonate at the bottom line, um, which is not always easy in the mining business. 
and and I think is is very much a reason why we've had the support of uh, uh, generalists. That I, I know a lot of people lament where are the generalists in our sector. Well, you know we have to find examples in our shareholder ranks, and uh, we'll look forward to adding to those as we uh, we demonstrate this business model moving forward. Um, you know, a, a pretty standard chart that will show us, uh, you know, hopefully getting re-ratings as we, um, uh, you know, get the first operation up and running. And then as we scale up that production rate, so we can get into a different level of uh, producer. Um, and in terms of catalysts uh, moving forward, you know, I would expect, um, you know, shortly, um, and I don't know when that will be. My guidance on my on permits was accurate. Uh, I try to give the most realistic uh, uh, guidance I can because I should be held accountable for such things. Uh, we are hoping uh, in the, the next little while to, to be able to put a, a pin in the funding that will be required for the Santana construction and, and allow us to start construction later this year for Santana with production plan for mid-2020. For Tuna, a construction decision is likely next year. Um, and, and that's about a 12 month build. So it will come on, uh, potentially, uh, sometime in 2021, adding another 50,000 ounces of production. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we will be exploring this year, uh, and then doing a, a tremendous amount more exploration when we, uh, up, are up and running at Santana. Uh, we have very low sustaining capex, uh, at our projects. So what we'll see instead of, Five million a year in sustaining capex is a lot of money deployed into drilling um, expansions of these uh, these operations. So, you know, I I, I find I who doesn't like uh, getting assays back? I I, I find that uh, uh, an exciting part of our business model. Um, we will and and have continued to look for additional assets that make sense for our operation our operational team um, that will again lend themselves to low capital intensity and build out that uh, because we don't want to get to 150,000 ounces and call it a day. That's when things get fun. Um, so our goal is to continue, hopefully having the latitude of time to to continue to build this out and, and um, put assets that have uh, fallen out of favor during a bad market together to build a really strong new gold mining company. And uh, we look forward to being able to present that progress uh, to everyone uh, over the coming years. And I think with that, um, and we can probably go to some of Derek's questions. Thank you. Sure, uh, sure, Doug. Uh, we have uh, we have several questions that came in before. And we thank you to everyone who who sent those questions in, and then we have some that have uh, sort of come in on the chat. So let's start with. Uh, the questions that came in before. Um, there's a few questions here about the uh, um, the exploration program that you just announced at Santana. Um, particularly, they're asking about the all-in cost of drilling, the planned meterage, uh, what type of uh, rig you're using, and then if there's any geophysics to go along with that. Um, okay, I'll, I'll address the last two parts of that. In terms of geophysics, um, when there is actually a lot of historical geophysical data on the project. Um, uh, we got a consultant who's uh, reprocessing a lot of that now. Uh, I don't think there will be a need to do any any fresh geophysics in terms of the drill rig. I don't know. Um, uh, we own our own drill rig, and I, I actually don't know. Um, I mean, apart from the fact that we 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 drill core, uh, whether it's a uh, you know a bought long ear or or something else, um, uh, I don't know. Drilling costs. Uh, we're probably talking some, you know, you have your own drill rig. I think people think everything's suddenly dramatically cheaper. What the drill rig allows you to do is have complete flexibility with how you drill. Uh, and whether if you want to stop drilling for a few weeks, um, you can, and you're not paying for, you know, your drill, dr drill operator to be on site during that time. Um, but we're probably talking somewhere around 150 all in for our drilling costs. Um, you know, which is fine for us. We, in, in terms of scale, we announced there was a release we put out in February of this year that gave guidance to what we wanted to drill this year. It was a 10, and, and that's in a, a pretty in depth in terms of where we were planning to drill, um, and, and roughly the 10,000 meters that was planned. I'm not sure if we'll do all that this year. 
um, largely because some of that drilling can be done out of cash flow and I, I, and it's not priority drilling. I think we want to put a few holes into a number of regional targets to make sure that they're similar to the Nicho style of mineralization as they, they appear to be. Um, most of our drilling this year, I think, will focus around where, we're, where we feel like we can already expand the, the known pit designs that we, we've got. And I know that we want to follow up on the Divisadero discovery last year because that was very significant for us. Um, so, uh, you know, that's that's roughly where we're at with the drilling at Santana. On the And then on that drill program, is there any uh, condemnation drilling plan for where the leach plants are going to be placed? At the uh, there is some, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly where we're putting a little bit of other infrastructure in. I, our, our understanding of this project has grown tremendously over the last uh, six, seven months. Um, that last drill program we did at the end of last year, which was just a modest 10 hole program, uh, proved to be very successful in showing the upside, but also that we, we need to actually drill off some areas um, that have proven to be mineralized now. So, you know, there will be some condemnation drilling. We planned, when my company and Darren's merged a year and a half ago, there, you know, a big part of, of the due diligence was making sure that we had areas for, for our uh, heat leach pads and the like. Um, uh, we, we feel pretty comfortable where the main plant project designs are right now that we are free of any known mineralization there. Our, our biggest problem is we've, we've yet to close out, uh, it's a nice problem to have, we've, we've yet to close out the uh, the actual pit designs that we've got right now. Uh, the drilling last year was some very significant step outs and uh, drill results. So that will be a focus. And I, and I guess going a little bit into the, the Santana development, um, I guess specifically, uh, and this is probably a question you get a lot, is um, when do you expect to finalize the uh, stream funding for Santana? Yeah, I think, um, you know, in our business, we're, we'll, we'll be looking at a top line royalty kind of deal, um, uh, you know, straight NSR on the, on the project. All I'll say is uh, I guided for end of September for the permit we just had. I proved to be very conservative on that one. I, uh, um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be so lucky on this, but uh, I'm speaking at the Denver Gold Show in uh, basically a little over a month's time. And I, I really, you know, if it's possible, um, and it's not always at our control, but if it's, a, if it's possible, it would be nice not to be tiptoeing around the subject of that. Um, I, what I would say is, you know, we had two big question marks up until a couple of weeks ago on the on the on the project and one of those was the final federal permits and the other was the funding side of things we actually got the one which was far more critical in my opinion uh you can have all the money you you want in the bank but if you haven't got permission to build what good is it for you exactly. so having the permit was the one area that was largely outside of our control somewhat in our control but largely outside of our control the funding funding very different in that regard so um you know we'll we'll be looking and we are right now looking to finalize that but you know anyone who's worked with lawyers knows sometimes uh, things can take a while on the drafting of such things so so it's going to be a busy month ahead now, uh, well we all we all love our lawyers so they they always seem to get paid and have to find a reason for it um the uh uh, and then just on the uh, um, on the construction, you know, going to that next step after funding, uh, and you meant you touched on the permits briefly. Um, are what are the further permitting requirements uh, that you need before you could start construction? Um, well, with the federal permit, with the MIA ETJ um, uh, permit, that actually allows us to pretty much do everything but start production. You know, construction, earthworks, everything can can start. So the the only remaining permits. Uh, you tend to apply during, well, you know, in, in our case, uh, while we're in the construction mode. So, so we have the permits now to actually start construction. Hence, another reason why I'd like to get that funding announced so that everyone can see that that timeline is is intact. Uh, it, it, you know, even if we'd only got the federal permit at the end of September, our guidance for when we could be in production next year was intact. This doesn't really change that. It just allows us to be as confident as we can be in those timelines because we weren't going to start construction during the rainy season. 
Um, so, you know, maybe it's end of October, early November that we can start. The last permits that you tend to get in Mexico are your explosive permits and your water permits. Uh, that whole process um, of applying for those and, and, you know, these last state permits uh, will just run um, in parallel with the construction that will be underway. Right. And I guess the, the the last question on this series is on Santana is with respect to construction and mining, is it going to be a contractors or company hired? And then also, uh, what's the accommodation at Santana? Is it camp or a sort of is there some, is a local town? And then, you know, what's the percentage of expats you're going to have uh, working down there? Okay. Uh, camp experts. Well, in terms of expats, very few. Like our, our, most of our technical team are Mexican uh, nationals that have worked with Darren for a long time. Darren, um, you know, is is where you'd want uh, the company CEO to be as the, one of the mind builders. He, he will be focusing a lot of his energies down there. Um, uh, but very few expats. In fact, we want this to be a collaboration with uh, Mexican community. Uh, Mexican mine contractors, which we've always used in the past at our other operations. Um, and so uh, very few expat hires will be required at all. Um, our latest uh, hire, uh, you know, Carolina Salas uh, worked with Darren before one of his mines. She's come in to help uh, uh, run things down there. Um, so, yeah, we're, there's not a lot of expat hires that are going to go on. I, I think you mentioned the camp. Uh, you know, we have a camp there. Uh, we would expand it. Uh, there's a, a local town with the community that uh, will support additional um, uh, uh, workers. So uh, uh, what I like about Mexico is you can only start the permitting process with community agreements in place. So we've got full community support here. Uh, we view it as a collaboration. I think as part of our permits, we had to kind of commit to a certain percentage of Mexican nationals that would be involved in this. And that was no problem for us because we're not looking in a whole load of people from uh, North America to, to build this. Sure. Okay. I guess we'll, uh, we'll, stick, to, uh, we'll stick to Santana based on uh, uh, some of the questions we have here. Um, the, uh, one of the questions was uh, the website still notes uh, – Q2 2019 for the 43101 timing. Uh, I'm assuming that's for Santana, uh, which is a, a, probably a popular question to get. When do you think that? Uh, what's the the updated guidance on that uh, that timing? Well, firstly, I apologize because I'm normally pretty good in making sure if things have changed for one reason or another, they, if that those changes have been reflected on the website. So uh, I will make that adjustment. Yeah. You know, with the government change at the beginning of the year, a lot of things um, uh, did slow down for a, a number of months. And it, it, that's one of those ones that it got pushed back a little. Uh, what's interesting to note with Santana is that there is no 43101 compliant resource. It's not to say that there isn't a very robust resource there and one that we could turn around next week and, and put into a... Uh, NI43-101 report. There was, you know, this deposit has been drilled off on 25 meter centers. Um, you know, we're, we're extremely comfortable on that. In fact, we're building it based on this internal modeling. The, the time of the merger, Darren double checked and the Cisco's technical team triple checked those numbers on the resource. It's very robust. Um, one of the reasons we want to do a 43-101, a maiden 43-101 on the project is it's fine for me to say we're going into production at 30,000 ounces a year next year, but if there's no economic study that's come out from, the first question I'm going to get from people is, well, what's the mine life? So if we can come out with a 43-101 resource, it will allow people to back calculate that. And I think as we come up with production guidance on an annual basis, with our whole uh, business model that's predicated on expanding the resources so we can expand the production profile, we'd probably come out with an annual updated uh, 43-101. So with that in mind, the drilling that we're going to do at the back half of this year focused you know, uh, around the, the known resources that we'd be looking to develop next year. Uh, my guess is we want to incorporate all that drilling into a program, so uh, into a, a maiden resource statement. So in advance of production started, I, starting, I would hope that Q1 of next year, uh, we would have that maiden resource. 
Um, and and that's that will just be the tip of the iceberg for Santana. We really do see a district-wide scale now where it lends itself to any kind of target resource size that we look at, any asset that we're picking up, you know, needs to show million and a half ounce potential because there's no point going through all the permitting to build a, a mine off a three or 400,000 ounce resource, spin out a bunch of cash there, but then have to deploy that on an ex a completely new deposit and go through that whole permitting again. So the, the ability to, to scale up these projects is, is an inherent part of our, our business model. Yeah. Um, and then a couple questions on the, uh, on the, on the, the heap leach at Santana. Um, are there, the first question is, are there any uh, cyanocides like uh, copper uh, in at Santana uh, or, and uh, what's the leach cycle uh, look like? Yeah, so so no, and uh, deeper down in the sulfides, and uh, the the oxidized profile takes you, you know, maybe to about sixty meters depth, and and then we're into some transitional material and sulfides. What's key here is the gold is in free form, so you know we're getting good seventy percent plus recoveries on at, even on the sulfide component of the resource. Uh, what's interesting is is probably at depth. We see these breccia pipes going into material that's more like the Visadero, um, but that's going to be at real depth. Um, the Visadero is going to be a very interesting uh, new discovery to follow up on because it is markedly more porphyritic looking in nature, you know, and, and probably represents um, uh, something more akin to the deep, to the plumbing system here. Um, and what's interesting for us is, is whether there is, um, a larger scale giant pit that you could base around that as well and maybe these first mines that we're doing are, are almost a pre-stripping um heap leach operation before we look at something which uh, which does have that copper kicker to it as well uh, the um the divisadero you know was uh yeah about almost a third of a percent copper but no not at nicho um and not in in the bulk of the the breccia pipes that we're we're looking at as the uh, the main gold production there at the property. Um, uh, there was another part of that question, I think. Um, no, I think, I think, I think, oh no, the, uh, the, the, the leach curve, the leach cycle. Oh yeah. We, as part of that 50,000 ton bulk sample, we did run a mine. We did a coarse crush. We also did a fine, fine crush and agglomerated product. Um, and we, we obviously saw what we didn't really see was, a marked change in uh, in overall recoveries between the coarse and the fine crush. What we did see was obviously enhanced leach kinetics, but we're probably on the coarse crush material looking somewhere at around a 45, uh, 45 to 60 day uh, leach cycle. So um, yeah, the kinetics of, of, of the fine crush were great, but we don't really feel the need for that. And the if, if there is a need to go to the coarse crush over run of mine, uh, the Mexican mining contractors we typically use down there offer the contracting uh, services as well. Uh, one thing, it's not part of that question, but I think is, you know, I, I omitted to describe why we could build these things so so cheaply. And, and the reason is we're not building refineries at site. Um, and that, that has two benefits. Obviously, we're saving a lot of CapEx. Um, going that route. We ship loaded carbon to Metals Research in Idaho uh, for stripping there. Uh, it's exactly what they did at El Castillo. It's exactly what Argonaut Gold continued to do there until they bought La Colorada uh, and shipped it there instead because there was a, a refinery there. So by doing that, our, our transportation cost of shipping our loaded carbon probably work out in, in the 5 to $7 an ounce range. And if we were producing gold at site, we definitely have to be paying, you know, adding security costs on there. So I think we're getting not only uh, a savings on the op cost, we're obviously saving uh, tremendously on the, the the upfront capital. And what I like about our, our team is we, we are looking for elegant ways to uh, cut costs, not corners. We're not doing anything that can't be done and hasn't been done by other people. Um, and we, we view it as... Uh, you know, elegant, elegant cost savings that allow us to build these things so cheaply. Great. Um, and now, I guess the a couple of maybe political questions. Uh, one earlier one we had is about security at site at Santana. 
and then uh, and then this, uh, this probably flows into that. Um, which unions, if any, will will you be using at uh, at Santana? I'm sorry, which unions? Um, yeah, that, you know, I I think in in terms of uh, well, I'll start with security first. Um, uh, you know, Mexico certainly has its problem areas, and uh, even Sonora has had, you know, which I think is a, 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 an excellent part of Mexico to be operating in, has had certain issues in the past. Um, but, you know, our team has never had major security issues at any of their operations. So much starts with good community relations. Um, and and it, it really is a, a core strength of our team. And I think it's because we're, you know, myself excluded largely uh, Mexican nationals here that understand operating down there. So um, whilst yes, there would be security, there would be a heck of a lot more security if we were producing gold at site, uh, for sure. Uh, I think the question with regard to unions is, you know, the goal from, you know, these are modest operations. These are actually the, one of the reasons the, the governor of Sonora is really excited about our mine is, we're, we're largely going to be employing people from local agrarian communities. You know, they're going to get good paying jobs. Uh, they're not the kinds of operations that are necessarily going to be big unionized workforces. I think that there is a strong uh, sense and probably an accurate one that uh, with the, the union strength in Mexico is, is gaining strength. Uh, we've seen 18, 20 percent increases in, in, in union settlements at the big operations. Grupo and and the like. I think an operation like ours can, you know, is is far less on the radar uh, in that regard. Uh, the key thing is working in a way where we are there to collaborate, uh, to to mine gold for for everyone's benefit. And uh, you know, I think we're going to be very proud of of building um, uh, building those relationships still further in these communities. Yeah. And I guess that that uh, that community question I think leads into uh, uh, some of the comments uh, made by the Mexican president uh, earlier this week regarding uh, mining, uh, particularly um, uh, with respect to whether they can add concessions and a few other uh, a few other comments. Do you think that's going to have any effect on Minera Alamos uh, as things stand right now? Um, I I think you you always need to make sure that you're aware of what's going on uh, down there and not uh, not treat statements lightly uh, that that's for sure um, in term the in terms of the concession situation not not only if, if there was a complete moratorium on new concessions our land, land packages are more than adequate as it stands right now I do I, I believe that any country in the world shouldn't allow companies to just uh, squat on concessions um, you know, especially if invited in, you know, as a foreign national, you know, uh, corporation, uh, you know, to, to a country's natural resources. A bigger issue is the former government actually had a huge backlog of concessions. There's about 80,000 concession applications in, in, in backlog right now. So it's actually quite easy to say you're not issuing new ones when you've got, and, and, and you'd be very accurate in that statement, when you're dealing with a huge backlog like that. I think for us and what we are planning to do, um, you know, we are gonna be a good corporate citizen down there. We will be producing, uh, you know, creating jobs um, and, and doing things the right way. And I, I think, I would be much more concerned if I, I, I was a company that was there and not really advancing land that they've been granted uh, by the government. So no, we, we don't see issues with it. I, I had conversations with the whole team last week when those headlines were making news and I've, I've always been guided uh, correctly by their knowledge on the ground and it, we're, we're not overly concerned with it, but we're obviously uh, tracking Lots of the things that are being said by the new government, a lot of them, um, uh, I think, are more populist statements than than necessarily some things which have a lot of meat on the bone. Okay, 
Um, and then I guess uh, a couple of, uh, of simpler questions um, is the uh, is the uh, is the cash on hand going to cover the the drilling uh, the drilling that you're planning to do? Yeah, it, it will. I, you know, we we were initially budgeting probably about one and a half million dollars uh, beginning of the year if we did that whole ten thousand meters this year, um, and we could we could still do that uh, now. I just think that. Uh, uh, those the, the the delay with the transitional government meant that we didn't really get any drilling started before um, before the rainy season, and we were so into the permitting process at that point. We've we've curtailed our drilling season to some extent, so it's not even a, it's not a function of cash, but more a function of what month we've got ahead of us this year uh, as to how much of that ten thousand meter program we will actually complete. There's there's clearly priority targets on that original 10,000 meter plan. But what we don't drill this year will be drilled next year. And as we cash flow at Santana, that drilling program will expand uh, uh, considerably. And I, I guess this is, a, this, is a, this is a question that came up while you were talking about uh, the cash flow you expect to generate. Um, and uh, the question is, uh, what's your definition of cash flow? Um, and I guess when you start talking about positive cash flow and what that means, um, lots of companies, lots of companies say they have positive cash flow, but it doesn't necessarily end up on the balance sheet. Yeah, well, it's like the whole nefarious uh, all-in sustaining cost metric. It's like what's what's all in. Um, <laughs> so no, I, I I absolutely agree. It's been a bit of a soapbox issue for me for 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 quite some time in this business. Um, I I hope that in many ways uh, a lot of my personal I'm not going to say grievances with the sector, um, you know, can be addressed with us trying to demonstrate we're doing it the right way. Um, I, you know, one of the things I would say is we're not looking and maybe it, it's frustrating. You know, it's funny, I, I, I speak to a lot of shareholders and I say slow and steady wins the race. And they get used to me saying that now, you know, I, I'm not. Uh, the most promotional person in this regard. I think that this thing should be a very, you know, you should only move to stage two if you got stage one sorted out. Um, our operating cash flow, um, even at 1250, you know, should have lent itself to us generating free cash that could be deployed um, uh, elsewhere. Uh, obviously, at higher gold prices, that that number, you know, is 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 going to get stronger, but. Uh, um, no, I mean, I, I want to be able to consistently show uh, quarter by quarter earnings. It won't happen in the first couple of quarters when we get into production. But I think if people can see the path to that, we're, we're, we're about, you know, our, our, our kind of an internal, you know, hive mind is we're about doing things the right way, you know, the Castle Gold way. Um, you know, this is a reboot of what they did so successfully at Castle Gold, and we we expect to do that again. Um, so, you know, I, I I'm sure there will be a lot of people that will you know probably give us a pat on the back when we start pouring our first goal, but at the same time we'll say, let's look at it in a few quarters, because there are instances of companies that say one thing, but when you actually look at the bottom line, the bottom line is not as pretty as uh, as was was kind of heralded. So, um, you know, I, all, all I can say to, to everything I, I've talked about in our business model is, you know, I, we, we should be held accountable for what we say and, and our, our objectives. To date, I think we've done a very good job at executing on that over the last 15 months. Um, they've certainly been some of the most rewarding ones I've had in my career. And I very much look forward to being held accountable to everything I've said today because I have a tremendous belief that our company actually can show people that, you know, you didn't need fourteen or fifteen hundred dollar gold to make money in this market. Um, and all that will mean is we can hopefully make quite a bit more for our shareholders. Great. Now, uh, last couple of questions are going to be uh, corporate focused because hopefully we can uh, we're pushing on to an hour. So we'll get this wrapped up shortly for everyone who's on. Um, I guess the question was, uh, there was a question about a cheap mill that you had in Quebec at one point. Is that still uh, an asset that uh, is in Monero uh, or, or is that the mill that uh, you guys are shipping down to uh, Fortuna? Yeah, that, that's the mill that we have. We bought, it's just another example of the creative ways of finding 
you know, elegant ways to cut costs. Uh, there was a company that owned this mill. They, they, but they also owed the CRA a bunch of money. Um, and Darren became aware of this and, and asked, uh, asked them how much they owed the CRA and told, I, I think the number was $800,000. So he said, okay, we'll give you the $800,000, but we'd like the mill, uh, to which they, you know, uh, accepted that. And uh, we sold some bits that we didn't need off it for another quarter million bucks. So, I mean, we basically got a 2,000 ton, 2000 ton a day mill sitting in 26 shipping containers. It's all been removed. Uh, the countries of origin checked for, for being able to freely get it into Mexico. It's probably going to cost us about half a million dollars to move down there. It's one of the reasons our capex at Fortuna is is modest um, because you know we we have this two thousand ton a day mill, um, so yes, that is in the company. It's a tremendous asset um, and uh, it, it's you know a tremendous uh, example of of as to say these ways we uh, we look to cut costs. Yeah, and it's very it's very creative and it's taking advantage of opportunities that, that get presented. Um, and then just sort of a little bit more on the on the high level philosophy of uh, for, uh, for 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 Minera. Um, do you do you guys consider yourselves a you're building something to be taken over, or are you a producer and you know are going to be buying you know focus on buying future mines, additional mines after this? I hope this is the last job I ever have in the business uh, because a it means that we've done done what we said we were going to do, but also. Uh, it means that we've been given the opportunity to not just get it to a certain point, but to take it the step after that. Um, I mean, to be honest, if we were to take this to 100, 100 150,000 ounces a year, um, could someone make an approach if we're doing things right and the assets and our expiration is showing the upside of those assets? Absolutely. Would that be a really nice... Um, uh, clean exit for our shareholders, I'm sure they'd be really happy about it. But that's also when the fun just begins. Like, I think, you know, at that point, you, you know, you've now got, you know, a buffet of, of assets similar to the ones that we will have built that production uh, base off that don't appeal to the bigger companies because they're still modest, but can augment that production profile to grow it still further. So I hope, you know, um, I hope that we actually can grow it still further because it means that we've built it right um, to start with, which is obviously most important. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think shareholders actually will benefit far more for allowing us to take it to that next step. And I guess you could look at at one point when Argonaut bought uh, Castle Gold for $130 million and then I think bought Pediment Gold for couple of hundred million, something like that. Those were really the assets in Argonaut Gold. And Argonaut in a gold market ran to uh, a, over a billion dollars market cap. So whilst those were good exits for those shareholders, there was clearly a lot of upside left on the table. Um, I'd like to capture that for everyone. I would hope that everyone, you know, once we built that out, can want to see what we can do next. Well, it's a... Uh... You uh, you have to build it like you're going to own it until someone uh, until someone offers you enough money to make it worth your while to leave, right? Sure. Um, and, and then I guess the, the just the last question is probably one you get you get occasionally is on um, uh, on on the uh, share count. Uh, are you guys looking considering a consolidation uh, at all? Uh, I know you touched on that a little bit on the when we went, covered that slide, and then uh, to go with that, uh, are you guys thinking about uplisting to the TSX? Yeah, I, I mean, the share count I don't think is as, as much a deterrent as anyone who wants to look back at the company early in the year. What we Our problem in our capital structure was the tremendous amount of legacy warrants from before Darren and my time that all happened to ex, you know, expire in a four-month period from April to June. Um, and they created a textbook cap on the stock, and then that cap was released. So... Um, Recently, we've been trading a lot of liquidity. Earlier in the year, we, we weren't. Um, I'm happy that our story is resonating with people. But if we went back to the liquidity levels of before, I think, you know, there were people that would say to me, oh, you should roll it back. 
Um, and I, I, if we were a different type of company, there's probably a lot of value in, in doing something like that or almost necessity. But I think we are a market cap story. I don't think, you know, I'm not thinking it, it's something that has to be done. And I certainly um, will always keep an open mind to something, um, but it's not something on the radar right now. I think rollbacks, I, you know, I've got friends who run companies that have done rollbacks. I won't mention these particular companies, but unless they're really at the right, at the right time with the right deal associated with it. But even then, you know, if, we, if there was a consolidation, I think it would be a very modest one. It would be just to tighten things up a little. It's not on the cards right now. I, I like how we're trading right now. We're not doing any real equity raises. Uh, so we need liquidity to allow people to take a position in the stock. Um, and I don't think we want to hurt that right now. So um, right now our, our, our focus is much more on building this out uh, and, and reinforcing to the market that we are a market cap story. And so the liquidity that uh, uh, a, a bit of a retail float creates in the stock is not necessarily the worst thing right now. All right. Um, and the second part of that question was a, an uplist to the TSX. Uh, I guess that's just a, that's probably a matter of time and uh, time and, and, mar and that market cap growing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had this conversation uh, with a fund manager this morning who's a shareholder and, and uh, you know, I don't think that that happens until we're in production and, and after a period of production from the first operation. So, uh, yeah, I would have, I, I think if we develop this business, then we, we would belong on the TSX, but I don't, I don't foresee that until probably at least three quarters of Santara. Like, so we're looking at 2021 for that, I would think. Um, but yeah, it should be the goal of a gold producer to be on the TSX. Um, uh, absolutely. Oh, okay. Uh, and that actually covers off the majority of the questions. So thank you everyone who su su submitted their questions. Um, and this has gone on a little bit longer than, than normal, but that's good. I, it's glad it's good to get a, it's good to answer all these questions. So I'd like to thank everybody for, for being on the line and, and paying uh, and uh, um, and and paying participating in the webinar today and sending in your questions. I'd like to thank you for your time, Doug. I know it's uh, you're busy as well, and so uh, to uh, to join us and tell us and talk to us about Monero Alamo. So uh, that is uh, that is all today. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Thanks.